It was like clutching the mane of a wild horse. Charles grasped frantically at straps, armrests, seat cushions, whatever he could find, as the taxi bounced, lurched, and careened, spending more time in the air than on the pavement. He wasn't sure how much more his quickly aging body could take. He'd already met the ceiling twice and been tossed against the door handles on both sides. Was this really a taxi? Was this really Russia? His driver, with frizzy red locks, budding facial hair, and a wide-eyed fixed smile, looked to Charles like an Irish farm boy. Despite his misgivings, however, the young driver seemed not only to know the fastest route from Sheremetyevo Airport to downtown Moscow, but to have signed a blood oath to get there before anyone else. Fortunately, the cobblestone streets over which he pushed his hovercraft were clean and dry, snowdrifts visible only in scattered, unattended courtyards. Charles barely recognized the multicolored crazy quilt of St. Vasily's onion domes as they plowed across red square scattering pedestrians, and in fact saw very little else that was familiar from his only other visit over 30 years before. The cab jolted to a stop in front of the hotel, and Charles crawled out cautiously. He gave the Mauchik a few more rubles than he had planned on. Protection money, he muttered <laughs> under his breath, hoping the boy had no English. His room on the eighth floor was practical, with a double bed, wardrobe, and a small table that would serve nicely as a desk, much comfier than his digs in the old days. He decided to email Murmansev immediately. He learned from the hotel desk that the room was wired for internet, and probably everything else, he muttered to himself, <coughs> remembering Brezhnev's Russia. He quickly wrote, Dear Professor Murmansev, here at last. I'm at the Mirsky on Moskovsky Prospect, room 846. I'd be delighted to meet at your convenience to hand over my story. Please send a message through cyberspace the moment you receive this, or whenever you are free from berating a student, turning a page, or munching a carrot. Moscow is beautiful, though colder than New York. Charles Abel Baker. Then he frowned and erased the line about the student and the carrot. What did he know about this guy's sense of humor? As he was slipping off his shoes for a nap, the phone rang. So soon. Certainly no problem with the internet over here. Tak, Russian history professor, came a woman's voice. No trouble finding your hotel. My God. Svetlana? They'd met and flirted on the plane, but he'd never really expected to see her again. A statuesque blonde, possibly in her early forties, she'd worn her turquoise aerofloat cap like a tiara. She was royalty, he thought, an empress of the air. And what was he? A fit but slightly over-the-hill ex-history professor and small-time writer, with a smallish paunch unless he sucked it in. She was Guinevere, and he certainly no Lancelot. Yet he was so smitten on the plain he'd had a hard time stumbling through his stiff-spined, half-remembered Russian, beginning with a trusted old sentence that described himself as having been a Russian history professor. Somehow he'd apparently, she'd apparently found his shaky declensions charming. When she'd learned he was a writer, even more so. She, he'd discovered, had once studied world literature at a university in Siberia, then become a stewardess. Though her English was heavily accented, it was miles ahead of his Russian. Charles wasn't even sure she'd understood why he was traveling to Russia, despite his attempts to explain. Nor did it matter, he figured, since 
he'd surely never see her again. He'd assume she was only being polite when she asked him which hotel. What a surprise! No, my driver had no trouble getting me here. He just drove in a straight line all the way from the airport, ignoring streets, stoplights, road signs, and even other cars. Typical. Which way he took you? Had my eyes closed most of the time. I did peek through my fingers at the Moscow River every once in a while. She laughed. The long way, but never mind. I was hoping you might like some company. You would like a visit? Although she couldn't see it, Charles' eyebrows had lifted off like a Saturn rocket. <laughs> what was she proposing? Should he be flattered or wary? A visit from you? <laughs> Who are you expecting, Maria Sharapova? <laughs> of course, me. Ah, well, I, I, I would of course love a visit from you, my goodness, uh, I, I, I'm just so surprised. Silly men, you flirt with me on plane and now you act surprised. Shall I come over now? Are you far away? She giggled. Same hotel. <laughs> Fifteen minutes? It was closer to twenty-five, but worth the wait. When he opened the door, she was leaning against the door jamb, one hand behind her back, Veronica Lake in an old Humphrey Bogart film, except that her blonde hair was worn up and fixed in place by... Was that a small paintbrush? Or a tool for applying cosmetics? Odd, in any case. She wore no uniform now, sporting instead a black miniskirt and gold lame blouse with pearls at her throat. All she needed was a rose between her gleaming white teeth. He'd known she was tall, but never guessed how much was due to her long legs. She reacted to his surprised expression. I know, I know, it's very 60s. Your 60s, not ours. In our 60s, I was a little girl. But I like retro. You know Screaming Mimi's in New York? I also have satin frock with taffeta petticoat from 50s. Like a musical Oklahoma. You prefer? Hey, no, please, don't change a thing. You look... Wonderful. He stepped back. Your wardrobe certainly beats mine, he added, reaching for neutral small talk. Right now I have only a change of shirt, some underwear, and two pairs of socks. Oh, and a, a second tie. Then we must get you out of that suit as soon as possible. Hang it up in bathroom with steam. You agree? She swept forth her hidden arm, revealing a bottle of Stolichnaya. Shall they pour us a glass? She was inside the room, but unable to tear his eyes from her, he'd still not managed to close the door. He did so now, watching as she disappeared into the bathroom and returned with two water glasses. Svetlana, this is all very lovely, but I'm afraid I don't drink anymore. I used to, but is so? She asked, placing the vodka and glasses on a bedside table with exaggerated care and seating herself primly on the bed. In that case, we skip vodka altogether. I don't need warm-ups. <laughs> it's more time to make love. You are agreeable? In New York, Charles lived alone and had not shared his apartment or bed with anyone for some time now. Uh, wow. <laughs> Are you sure? This is so unexpected. The hum in his head that had begun when he'd first caught sight of her in the Aerofloat aisle had returned only twice as loud. You do not wish? You are married, perhaps? Yet, yet. Uh, nothing like that. Yanyamagu uh, I just can't believe my luck. Oh, please. I am lucky one. I studied literature in school, but 
Do you know how many writers I have met on my travels? Nikawa. I love history, but how many historians you think I meet up in air? Nikawa. <laughs> now I meet both in one big strong man. <laughs> I also love buried treasure. Why should I not want to get acquainted? Perhaps you do not find me attractive. He laughed softly, looked down a moment, then crossed the intervening distance and sank to the carpet in front of her. Fine. Through her eyes, he was happy to be historian, writer, strong man, and a piece of buried treasure just waiting to be dug up after a thousand years spent below ground. He no longer felt uneasy, only grateful. Yes, I find you attractive, he said. His voice had gathered force. To be honest, you make my head spin. Yet, my goodness. When young, maybe, I turn heads, but am old lady of forties now. Thank you for saying, however. You are not only professor, you are romantic. It's true? Or maybe just good writer. <laughs> he took her hands, kissing first one, then the other. Her long legs were thrillingly close. As an American minister might say, on behalf of his congregation, for the bounty we are about to receive, <laughs> we thank you. She smiled. Silly man. 